Mary Claire Speckner with the Bartholomew County Public Library, and I want to welcome you to tonight's event. It's an interview with Jean Thompson, the author of this year's Community Book Read Selection, The Year We Left Home. And we hope a lot of you have read that book by now. We've had them out for people to read for a couple of weeks. Tonight's interview is with the author, Jean Thompson, and it was recorded by Indiana Humanities several months ago, back in November, I believe. And we are using this interview because she is the author of the book, and also because Indiana Humanities gave grants to several libraries in the state, including our library, to read that year we left home. And so we're really glad to bring you this interview. We do apologize in advance. There's kind of a little sketchy, it's not that really good quality of an interview, but it's worth listening to because she is the author of the book. Also, Jean is interviewed by Barbara Shoup during this interview, and Barbara is doing another Zoom event for us live on Wednesday for the Community Book Read. So enjoy the interview, and we hope you enjoy reading The Year We Left Home by Jean Thompson. Thank you. Tonight's virtual in conversation with author Jean Thompson. Tonight is the final event of our inseparable theme, which over the last two years has asked Hoosiers to consider the ways that we are connected and divided across urban and rural lines, what separates us and what unites us. I can't imagine a more important conversation to be having in November, 2020. We picked the year we left home for our 2020 One State, One Story selection because it could help us talk a lot about the big ideas of inseparable. Beginning in Iowa in 1973, the novel follows the Erickson family through the many changes affecting American life at the end of the 20th century. From city rooftops to country farms, college campuses to small town main streets, the characters in Thompson's novel search for fulfillment and happiness in an ever-changing, often alienating country. The story asks us to consider the enduring, uniting power of place and why we choose or are forced to leave and when we decide to come home. If you're taking part in our statewide read, we are especially excited that you are here with us tonight. Thank you. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed thinking, reading, and talking about the year we left home. This time last year, we began working with Jean to design a multi-city tour of Indiana. While we are sorry that COVID has disrupted our plans to gather in person, we are so grateful for Jean's willingness to be part of tonight's virtual event. And we thank you in advance for your patience with any technical difficulties. So here's how tonight's event will go. In a moment, I'm gonna welcome Jean to the virtual stage. She has actually written an original piece of writing for tonight's event um, that will introduce herself and a little bit about her connections to Indiana and why she's excited. And we didn't know she had connections to Indiana until we first started talking to Jean about a year ago. So I'm really excited for her to get to share this piece of writing with us. Um, after Jean's reading, she will be joined by Barb Shoup who will interview Jean in what we call an in-conversation style format. Our goal with in-conversation is for, to have curious, thought-provoking, candid, and fun conversations. So we don't know exactly where it will go, but hopefully it will be really lively and really interesting. Having sat in on several planning discussions so far, I know that these two women are up to the task. Um, I can't wait to hear these two women writers talking about the writing process, about the year we left home, and I hope maybe a little bit about Midwestern identity and literature set here more generally. We will open it up to questions at the end. So if you are watching on Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature, question and answer feature, to pose your question at any point during tonight's event. If you're watching on Facebook, you can just add your question to the chat and someone from our team will make sure it gets relayed back to us. Um, and we, I will do my best um, to relay those questions, as many of them as we can, to Jean and Barb. You can also ask a question for both Jean and Barb, or Jean or Barb. We'll break for questions by about 7.45, um, and our goal is to conclude tonight's event right at 8 o'clock. Um, so now I would like to just, before I welcome Jean and Barb up, I'm going to read their bios for you. Jean Thompson is a novelist and short story writer. Her works include the novels A Cloud in the Shape of a Girl and the award-winning short story collection Who Do You Love? Jean's short fiction has been published in many magazines and journals, including The New Yorker and, anthology, and anthologized in the, Amer the Best American Short Stories and the Pushcart Prize. 
Thompson has been the recipient of Guggenheim and National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, among other accolades, and has taught creative writing at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Reed College, Northwestern University, and other colleges and universities. She lives in Urbana, Illinois. Barb Shoup is the author of eight novels for adults and young adults, a memoir, and two books about the creative process. Most recently, An American Tune and Looking for Jack Kerouac, and two books about writing, A Commotion in Your Heart, Notes About Writing in Life, and Novel Ideas, Contemporary Authors Share the Creative Process. Her creative nonfiction has been published recently in Atticus, Ocotillo Review, and another Chicago magazine. She is the writer in residence at the Indiana Writers Center. She was the longtime director there before and is a faculty member at the Art Workshop International. When we sat down to figure out who should have the conversation with Jean for tonight's event, it was very obvious to us that Barb Shoup was the best person. Um, and we're grateful for um, Barb's time and thoughtfulness. So at this point, I'm going to welcome Jean to the virtual stage and I'll see you all back at 745. Okay, well, let me first uh, thank Indiana Humanities and everybody involved for selecting me uh, for your event to begin with, for planning the event and then replanning it all over again so we could do it virtually. It's just been so much fun for them, I'm sure. But uh, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be around actual readers, even though you're out there in space somewhere. Uh, I, I don't know what you imagine a writer's life is like, but it's really just sitting in a room by yourself going, oh, that part's good, or oh, no, that part's bad. And, you know, does, does this stuff ever go out in the world? Does anybody ever really read it? So you're my readers, and I'm very happy that you're here. Um, so yes, I did want to read a little intro uh, to myself, but first, I need to show you an artifact from Indiana. You probably can't see it terribly well, but this is a commemorative plate for the Rockport, Spencer County, Indiana, sesquicentennial year 1968, which I seem to have inherited from my Indiana grandmother. Um, if this item would make anybody out there really happy to have you, you should let me know. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what to do with it. Okay, so let me do just a couple of awkward things. Um, this this is a, a about a three page little piece that I wanted to to share with you. My father was born in Chicago, but his family and past generations had come from far southern Indiana, from Grandview. When my grandfather died, my grandmother moved back to the area to Rockport. And that's where we'd visit her when I was a kid. It was a small town and we were often sulky and bored there in spite of my grandmother's best efforts to entertain us with trips to the little downtown or to the Lincoln Village. My grandmother was a country woman in spite of her years in Chicago. She said things like land sake and I swan, phrases meant to avoid taking the Lord's name in vain or swearing. Uh, let me just interject, uh, interject, I gave Aunt Martha in the year we, we left home that particular speech pattern. It was one of my favorite things about my grandmother. So now it's Aunt Martha. Uh, she kept birds, canaries and parakeets, finches, a cockatiel, an African lovebird, a small half moon parrot. There was also a big foul tempered macaw, Poncho. Poncho and my grandmother used to get into shouting matches, and once she got so mad at him, she took his cage out into the yard and turned the hose on him. Always on our visits, we took her back to Grandview. Grandview was even smaller than Rockport, green and weedy and overgrown, a portal to the past. We stopped by the cemetery with the oldest stones going back a hundred years or more. We went to see my grandmother's old friend, Dolly. We sat in Dolly's parlor and fanned ourselves with paper and stick fans decorated with pictures of Jesus and Miss Liberty. There was a photograph of a young man in uniform and it was understood that he had died in the war, although which war was unclear to me. We looked through the scrapbook of newspaper clippings about the great Ohio River flood of 1937 when Roosevelt sent in WPA workers to do the cleanup. We stopped to say hello to Elno, who was maybe a man or maybe a woman, I was never sure, and who operated the two gas pumps in town. 
On the way back to Rockport, we drove through a place my dad called Owl Town because he said only owls lived there. It was deep woods, a land of hills and hollers, and we were told that people lived there, but we would not see them because no one from the outside ever did. My family, like most others, had its share of secrets. And here I want to start making connections between our, our personal histories and our, our regional and national histories and between what we know and what remains unknown. My father's name was Tom T. Thompson. Tom, not Thomas. We kids were told it was none of our business what that center T stood for, which of course made us determined to discover it. I finally found it in his college yearbook. Tom Truly Thompson. His parents were first cousins, something else not generally advertised. They didn't grow up together. They met when my grandfather deserted his first wife and sons in Chicago and traveled to Grandview. He and my grandmother married and settled back in Chicago where my father was born. One day, two young men came to the door, my father's half brothers. He hadn't known they existed. Grandpa, my father said, enjoyed the visit but told his sons not to come again. And they never did. Why and how and what had happened among them, you will never know. There's an even older story about my grandfather quarreling with his mother and brothers and sister, changing his first name so they'd have difficulty finding him. The 1900 census when my grandfather was 10 years old lists his widowed mother as a laundress, his 17 year old sister as a waitress. My grandfather became a teamster in the original sense of driving a team of horses. He drove a milk wagon and later a truck for Borden's Dairy in Chicago. Why so many disruptions and disappearances? Why, as my father remembered, was there always a bottle of whiskey in the cupboard when he was growing up, a bottle that was never opened like a promise or a threat? In 1964, my father asked my great uncle George, born in 1895, to write down any family history he could remember. Uncle George drew from memory a map of Grandview as it was around 1900. Whatever you remember, write it down and pass it on. It's unlikely to stay the same. The map shows what must have been a thriving small town with a hotel, a library, a confectionery, a pool room, a barber shop, a watch repair shop, churches, a schoolhouse, a traction station for the light rail system that connected the little towns. Such towns have so often been hollowed out by the pull of the cities, by Walmarts and interstates. George might have stayed put in Grandview except for World War I, which sent him overseas and gave him enough restlessness to move to Evansville. Here are some portions of his accompanying letter. Um, these, these crack me up. Girls in those days could make a living and get away from home by doing cooking and housework in the cities. A lot of them learned city ways such as meat and vegetables and salad instead of just putting everything they had canned on the table. And if a boy was oversized, maybe dumb, maybe restless, he could go to the Navy as early as 14 and stare wide-eyed in wonder at the bustling outside world he never knew existed before. Grandview is right on the Ohio River and George remembers the showboat coming to town and advertising its shows with a parade down Main Street. And as a writer, I enjoy the different forms of diction George uses when he's trying to be elevated and literary as in. There was a time around the turn of the century when it was felt that reading books could be the ruin in all your eyes. Twas better that the parson did the reading for you. Then there's this more down to earth observation. Only one time did the shotgun serve as best man at a family wedding. The first Tom that we hear about in the family was born in 1832 and came to Indiana when he was 15, traveling from Virginia where his parents had died through the Cumberland Gap to what became Grandview, or so it's come down to us. Formal record keeping fails most ordinary people, poor people like my Indiana kin. When Tom died more than 40 years later, a family story says that a young doctor from Indianapolis dug up his body to use in medical study. No proof of that, but it makes for good telling. It's only because he became president that we know Abraham Lincoln and his family lived in the same part of the state from 1816 to 1830, near Pigeon Creek in what became Spencer County. Kentucky, where the Lincolns had lived before, was a slaveholding state. Indiana was free, as specified at the formation of the Northwest Territory. What difference might that have made when it came to his view of slavery? 
Nancy Hanks Lincoln, his mother, was one of the many settlers who died of what was called milk sickness. A Shawnee woman told the pioneers about the white snake root plant and that when cows ate it, their milk was poisoned. What was her name? Another unknown. The passenger pigeons that gave Pigeon Creek its name? Long since extinct. By the time Uncle George was born, proper houses had been built, but pioneer life was within memory. George extols the good old days, that simpler time of hard work and few comforts, but solid virtues and satisfaction. But he also writes this, now I've had a night's sleep, or at least a part. I awakened deep in the night and the wind was blowing, whimpering its lament under the eaves. As the wind continued to cry, I lay there thinking, maybe what I've said above, painted too rosy a picture of the country wherein lie your forebears. The wind to me is the voice of all the heartbreak and the voice of all life's sadness. If you could go back to some of the early houses of your great and great great grandfather's days, you would feel that the wind had its beginnings in such a house. These houses, he says, were tiny crude things, one or two rooms with a rough plank floor and a peg ladder up to a cold dark loft bare subsistence living, days of 14 hour labor, and just getting by, or sometimes not getting by. The past is ours to investigate, and if you are a writer of fiction, to invent. There's a set of direction to find old Tom's gravesite, which used to be marked with native stone, but that's long since worn away. The directions send you two miles east from the post office until you come to a country road, one tenth of a mile west of the New Hope Bible Church, Turn left for three-tenths of a mile, follow the bend in the road to the left until you come to the power lines and proceed 60 feet from the left edge of the road. The landmarks may lo no longer be there. The gravestone is gone, the body stolen. These are the gaps in memory, the history that is just out of our reach. This is the place where the archivist gives up and where the fiction writer gets to work. So thank you, that's the end of that. <laughs> that I wanted to share with you. So let's see, Barb, I think I'm all yours. All right, here I am. Excellent. Okay. I have done that. All right, so I will uh, say also that I'm really glad to be here and that uh, I have been a fan of Jean's for a long time. So I was really excited to get this opportunity to talk to her and ask her the questions that I have always wanted to ask her. So here we are, this is great. And um, now that I know about your Indiana connection, we can claim you, which I think is really cool. And Vonnegut, who said, I don't know what it is about Hoosiers, but wherever you go, there is always a Hoosier doing something very important there. Okay. Yes. There you go. So that would be us right now. Okay. Um, yes. So um, I'm just going to jump in and ask you some of the things that uh, some things we've talked about a little bit and, and some uh, questions that came from several discussion groups that I did with the book, which was really fun. And so my first question is, let's just start with chapter one. Um, I love the way it introduces everybody who's going to be there and who's going to be important to the book. Um, and I remember I when I picked up the book to reread it, knowing that I was going to talk to you. I remembered reading it the first time and getting to the end of the first chapter and being so shocked when the second, the next chapter wasn't going to be about Ryan. And I had to adjust to that, which I did. And I was fine with it. But um, it's such a strong chapter. It, it really made me want to keep reading. And I, I want to know um, sort of how you felt when you came to the end of that chapter and the way this book is like stepping stones through time. Um, how'd you feel when you ended it and how did you feel it unfolding from there? Well, I, I really liked that first chapter myself, she said immodestly, um, and I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory about it, but uh, just to, to jump a little bit, uh, I wanted the book to have scope. Um, I, wanted to cover, I wanted it to cover a lot of time. I wanted it to cover all these different characters as they progress through time. And so, yes, there you jump here and there and here and there. Uh, but, um, you know, I also, I, what I said upon was that each chapter was going to have its own kind of ending point that would feel as direct and um, substantial as the ending of a story. 
So it's not a novel in stories, which is a whole different thing. But uh, that each chapter was going to be, in a way, self-contained, so that you'd feel that something had happened the way you do at the end of a story, before you gathered your forces and jumped into somebody else's head and somebody else, and, and a different in a different time. Um, so I, I don't know if that you know uh, I, I knew what I was going to be doing, so I knew I had to end with some kind of definitive note. Now, how that chapter came to be, I went to a wedding in Iowa many a year ago. Uh, people that I've long since lost touch with, but this was the wedding. Uh, you know, I, I forget the ceremony, but I was struck by that there were these two different receptions, one churchy and non-alcoholic, and the other was where you cut loose and had a good time. And there was a, 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 a Martha and a Norm figures. Who, who, who are they really? I don't know. They're my characters now. But, and they actually did do this. They brought all the food and they worked, and they worked and worked and worked and scrubbed the kitchen and got everything together. And then they got their little can of dance wax. Do we, does anybody know what dance wax is? It's, it's like, you know, wax you put on the floor so you can glide around. And they cut a rug, <laughs> you know, they just danced the way there's a, uh, it, it's, it's a generational thing, I think, of people that grew up when dancing was dancing, you didn't just, you know, do this. Um, there were steps and sequences and everything. And, and everyone was just so taken with this. So that's the genesis of that. Now, a further story. Years later, after the book came out, I'm in Iowa and I'm reading to a group of librarians um, and, uh, who had invited me to give a speech or something and um, talking and this woman in the audience starts waving her hand and going, hey, yeah, I got married like that. I got married like that. You know, um, yeah, I made my own wedding cake. I had two receptions and, and I'm going, wow, did you know what's your name? And, and yeah, wh where are you from anyway? So uh, it's just been the strangest thing. You know, here's reality, here's the fiction that you make of it. And then here's some other, somebody else's reality on the other side. So that's maybe more than you wanted to hear about that first chapter, but that's uh, that, that's the story behind it. Yeah. it in itself into fiction the, and you know in small and large ways like the wedding is a large way because it's really the whole chapter but the detail of, of Martha and Norm is just I mean it's like your your head is sort of like a slush machine and there's all this stuff going around in there all the time and just at the right moment for a story there it is you know it comes out exactly yeah. And, and I, I couldn't have made that up. No, I know. And those kind of details have that feeling to them to me. I, yeah. I watch for them now. And I, I wondered about that even when I when I read it. So so you always knew that it was going to be a stepping stone kind of kind of thing. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I had a, a general plan. I mean, I had no idea what was going to happen to any of these people. But I knew that things were going to progress over time. Yeah. And, yeah. and that we were going to go from one character to another you know so yeah um i one thing that fascinates me about this book is how much is left out um you know we go years you know at a leap and and just pick pick people up where they are and i finished the book feeling that i knew everything about the characters that i really needed to know i didn't need all that stuff that was in between which is sort of the hemingway thing you know with the iceberg and what you know is underneath and yes there between the lines, but I, I wonder how you know what's enough. Did you, was there ever a point in the book where you kind of looked at what you had and said, I need something more there or, or that's too much there to get that? Well, I, I think I was probably more concerned about the economy of it mm -hmm. and stopping, you know, where, where it was time to stop, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and whose whose story would be in which particular period of time? Yeah, I mean, I knew Ryan was going to be the character that goes through the most changes, and so you know he's he's the constant. You know, he's the one that you meet when he's seventeen, and then again when he's forty-seven. You know, yeah. so he kind of bookends things. But you know, I uh, I reread the book as I was telling uh, people earlier. 
uh, just so I could be prepared for it. And, you know, I had more fun reading, uh, rereading Anita than I think almost anyone else. So, um, because she's a character that you start off not necessarily having any sympathy with. And mm -hmm. then I think you get some sympathy and then you go, go darn it. You know, she, she really, she made the most of what she had. Um, so, you know, I, I found myself kind of trading um, alliances among, among the characters, but, but Ryan was the one, Ryan's the one who starts off with the great, great ambitions, you know, He's going to get out of town. He's going to go accomplish things, uh, you know. So, and he does. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Although, although he's a little beat up by the end, uh, you know, but yeah. as as we all are, uh, right. you know, with from life, uh, you know, so. Yeah. Well, I I think um, I'll just kind of skip to this because we're we're talking about it already. That difference between Anita, who she doesn't have a lot of ambition, but yet she comes to a place in her life where she's she's made an interesting enough life for herself and she's yeah. you know, she respects herself and people respect her um and that's a kind of happiness i think whereas ryan just feels unsettled all the time he doesn't belong at home anymore and he can't he doesn't really seem to belong anywhere else and and i think there that's kind of the cost of of making that kind of leap from where you begin that you never, never quite fit. I thought you did that really well. Um, there's, uh, thank you. There's, there's a, a part where, and of course, now I can't find it, where he's, he's speculating, he's looking back and he's saying he used to want to go experience the world and then he wanted to go change it and then he was afraid it was passing him by. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's, he's a kind of sadder but wiser guy. Uh, you know. Yeah. I, I think that's right. And, and I thought it was really touching that, that one of the, that, that the end, in the end, he came home, but not he came home in the way that he could. He yeah. bought the farmhouse. He was going to put his cousin there and make sure he was okay. So he, he had a stake there um, and he cared about the place, but he couldn't be there. Right. Well, and, and Chip, uh, you know, we can talk about Chip too. Um, you know, they, they start out the book with Ryan kind of being envious of Chip because Chip has gone to war and he's gone out in the world and, um, and, and Chip goes out in the world in a way that just kind of, that, that's not very savory, uh, you know, or, or very wholesome for him. You know, Chip is, Chip is involved in some ugly stuff, I think, uh, you know, but, um, you know, he, he comes home. Yeah, and they take care of him. Right. So, cool. Yeah, yeah, and he, um, you know, he is a, a great example of the the thousands of young men who went to Vietnam and and came home and were never really okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you know, just to segue a little bit, the book does deal with with the, the political issues of the time, and that's one of them because we we see Chip and we see what the war has done to him. Um, but we also also see um, the effect of the farm, the the um, all the foreclosures on on farms and land. Uh, what what was that in the eighties? I guess kind of yeah, in the eighties. And uh, just to to jump from that, I, I did want the book to kind of echo with history, with American history, that um, you know, in a way that I hope was not too heavy handed. Um, that. There's the Vietnam War. There's the farm crisis. Uh, sorry. Anyway, uh, there's the we Barb. We we finally remembered the Donner Party. The you know the pioneers that went over the Sierra Nevadas and came to grief. Uh, there's the orphan train. Uh, you know there there are there's history kind of referred to as they're living through it. And uh, certainly when um, when Ryan is teaching uh, poli sci, you know he's he's very overt about that. Oh yes, there was this and there was that and movements of people and the Black Panthers and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I wanted the book to have that kind of scope. So it would open up and not just be about this person or that character, but about the, the world they lived in. <laughs> well, and how the world affected their day-to-day -day lives. I think, but would you talk about that chapter with Anita where she tries to help part of the family who's lost their farm? 
Oh, uh, well, yeah, uh, I think that's, that's where she really kind of breaks free uh, in a way. Um, for, you know, just, just to summarize, there's, uh, she has some cousins who are in the farm crisis, you know, the, the bank and her, her, her husband is a banker. Uh, and the banks are foreclosing on these loans uh, because the farmers, oh, I'm, I'm not really qualified to give you a good overview, but they overextended themselves. Times were good. They bought more equipment, more fertilizer, more cropland. The bottom fell out. They still owed the bank. Uh, there, there really were these dreadful episodes of farmers, you know, suiciding uh, or killing others, taking others with them. Sometimes the bankers, sometimes their families, sometimes both, uh, because they had just been driven to desperation. I mean, it, it, it wasn't quite like the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, you know, the land was still there, but it was every bit as economically devastating. And, you know, I mean, I live in a farm state too, and all around me, I can see people working jobs that, um, you know, a couple generations ago, three generations ago, they'd be farmers, you know, before things became so consolidated and, uh, you know, agribusiness took over. Um, and uh, again, there's, uh, so, so what Anita does in the chapter we were talking about is, uh, you know, siphons some money <laughs> out of the joint account and goes to the auction where her cousins are, where everything is, everything is being sold. You know, the, the curtains off of the windows, uh, you know, the, the furniture, the, the household goods, you know. So, you know, and, and she encounters one of her relatives and says, here, here's money, figure it out, you know, buy some of their stuff back for them. And that's her gesture of, um, you know, kind of solidarity with them. And of course, everyone in this town knows who she is and knows that her husband is a banker. And she goes back to where her car has been parked and all the tires have been slashed. You know, so no, no super happy ending there. <laughs> you know, but, but that I think marks her kind of independence. You know, she's, she's someone who feels very burdened as the mother of young children. And the wife of an alcoholic, you know, who's just kind of coming into his, you know, good old drinking days. Um, so anyway, that's Anita. And, but I had fun with her and I thought, now, how is she going to end up? Well, of course, she's going to sell real estate. She's going to be very good at it. She's going to be very successful. <laughs> yeah, I just, and, and it was so interesting because her dream was really just to be the wife and the mom and to have a nice home. And, and it flipped on her. But in the end, I think she, of all of them, she was probably the, the happiest. Um, well, well, she, she, you know, she, she was the one who didn't want to leave home. And, oh, she, right. and she was the queen bee, you know, she was the prettiest girl in, in her class. And, you know, there, there's a certain kind of expectation that comes with that. But, uh, you know, so she's, I mean, she's, she's, a, she's a conventional character in yeah. a lot of ways, but um, yeah, she, she does what she needs to do, huh, you know, to have her own life. Huh, yeah. yeah, but, but she also, I, I find her interesting because she stays connected to her mom. She goes out, the, you know, farm while Norman, um, Martha are still alive and she yeah. takes on that responsibility, which in an interesting way to me, her mom did not because yeah. Audrey, the mother, just sort of fell apart when the daughter Tori left and she she was only a mother. That's all she was. And she had never sort of looked beyond that. But yeah. yet she didn't do that thing, which would be to take over the family, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, you know, you mentioned Anita goes out to see Aunt Martha when, and, and it's talking with Aunt Martha kind of, I think, ignites a little spark in her uh, because she's saying she's alone with Martha, who's on her deathbed, and and she's saying, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Um, and Martha says something like, Well, don't wait until you're an old sick woman in bed, and it's too late. <laughs> and, and so, and she goes out and she rams her husband's car into a rock, uh, you know, just just for fun. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I had a good time with Anita. <laughs> I, I can see why she actually turned out being. <laughs> pretty complex and wonderful 
wonderful character and a, and a really interesting balance to to Ryan, who was kind of not exactly the hope of the family, but the one who had succeeded mater materially in a way that nobody else really did. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am sort of interested. We talked a little bit about the Midwest and, you know, kind of what, what is a Midwestern book? What do Midwestern people write about or what, how are they different writers than other people? And um, this to me, I mean, if there's a Midwestern book, this is a Midwestern book. It certainly is a Midwestern family in a Midwestern world, but it's also universal. Um, do you have any thoughts on the Midwestern thing? We tried, Barb and I tried, you know, to come to come up with some thoughts. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think there's kind of a built-in inferiority complex in a way, you know, about uh, being from the Midwest, you know, which, which you know, kind of gets me angry. Uh, you know, that we're, we're all kind of on the defensive, you know, well, uh, you know, the East Coast girls are hip. We really dig those styles they wear. You know, uh, the East Coast is hip. California is groovy. You know, the South has history. What the heck do we have? Well, we have what's left over, uh, you know. Um, and uh, I, I think that's not a bad place to be. I think that's a good vantage point for a writer, you know, to to be just kind of looking at everybody else and, you know, saying, yeah, well, we're, you know, we're still here. Don't count us out. Uh, you know, um, you know, I, I think um, uh, just, we should, we should uh, at least try to address the, um, what brings us together and what drives us apart or something like that. Maybe this is a good time to do that. And, and I was thinking about that and I was thinking of all the, the you know expected things like geography and shared experience but you know I, I think and maybe this year is a good time to reflect on this one thing that brings people together I think is hardship you know? yeah and I think we've all had plenty of that uh and we understand maybe a little bit more what because our the trauma that we've all been through with with the virus and uh, the way it's impacted everything and everybody from the way we live to the people we've lost. I think that is actually something that in a hopeful world will unite us. You know, so that's, that's about as optimistic as I can be. <laughs> you know, so you don't okay. have the benefit of my optimism, such yeah. as it is. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not the world's most optimistic person either, but I, I <laughs> talked about at one point the idea how reading can can bring people together, yes. and the yeah. idea that when you're reading good fiction with complex characters and you know no villains and no easy answers, that that we learn a lot about human nature that we wouldn't know just by observing because we are on, we're inside people's heads that aren't our own heads. And, and we begin to realize that, you know, just like we are not, we are not able to present in the world what we really are inside, neither is anybody else doing that. And so it, it makes me feel like I could give people a little bit of a break sometimes because what I'm seeing and hearing, I know is not the only thing. And I wouldn't know that if I didn't read fiction. Yeah, and, and point of view is such an interesting concept. You know, you, you walk around confined to your own, but if you make the attempt at least to say, well, where, where the heck are you coming from? Uh, you know, and I, I think I shared with you, Barb, the uh, uh, Russell Banks, the end of the Russell Banks novel, Continental Drift, where he says, uh, good cheer and mournfulness over invented lives help deprive the world of some of the greed that it, needs to keep itself going so go my book and help destroy the world as it is you know i think that's a wonderful motto you know for for anyone but especially for a fiction writer yeah. so, uh, let's 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 break down just a few barriers once in a while huh, you know huh. um, they, do they yeah. really do and i think people talking about books really make it even happen even more so that's um that's something i that i think is a, is a real connector, um, which here's another question. I, I can't remember we, whether we talked about this or not, but, you know, just in terms of talking about place and the kind of writing 
or writers that come out of a place is is it um, is it the same in rural urban is it more class that makes a writer than play no answer right all the best questions I, I I sure wish I knew um you know I once I I was at the I've been many times at the Indiana University Writers Workshop in the summer and um always really interesting people show up at the workshop and some of them are practice writers and some of them are, are not and there was a young man and maybe he's out there someplace and he was a farmer uh, he had a family farm and who, who knows me, this was yet one more time when times were hard. Uh, and he was a very talented writer, but, you know, his life was, you know, wake up, disc the beans, uh, you know, go get a side job in town, you know, because times were hard. And, and what in the heck kind of advice could I give him of, you know, if he were a college student, I'd say, well, you know, continue taking your writing courses and, you know, maybe you know, consider a, a college major or something like that. And, and boy, I, I, I sure haven't forgotten him. Uh, you know, I, I wonder, I, I think I was able to say something like try and go to more events like this and nurture your writing any way you can. But, uh, you know, there's, there's sometimes not a lot of leisure time to practice the arts. Well, yeah. that's right. and, yeah. and there's not, um, and I'll, I'll just throw a little plug in here for the Indiana Writers Center, because one of the things that's really important to us is to create a community of writers. We have created a community of writers. And so people who, for whatever reason, are, didn't get educated as a writer or, or don't want to go that route, there's a place for them to be. And yeah. um, gosh, we have a, a lot of amazing writers who take classes and, and teach with us. So, um, you know, for those people like this guy, well, I hope he's listening because, you know, come to the Writer Center and, and we can help you. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting where people are coming from and, and, and where they're writing from, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. and, and I'll say just this hopeful, Thing to, I mean, I'm sure some of the people who are listening to us are writers or want to be writers. And, and, you know, what a fraught enterprise. I mean, how hard is it to go from this thing that you're putting together at your dining room table to it going out in the world and being read by anyone? And especially these days, and if you're around writers or publishers or agents, I mean, it's just continual whining you know, about book sales and bookstores are closing and what you know what what are you going to do and you know this is what I, I have always told um, workshop students is you'd better take joy in what you do the joy between you and and the the page that you're writing you'd better get no end of a kick out of that you know no matter where that page ends up whether it it takes a journey away from you, whether you share it with friends, whether it, it doesn't go very far, whether you tear it up and start over, you'd better just really enjoy the hell out of that part because that's the only portion that you really have any control over. Right, and I think for a lot of writers, at least for me, it, 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 create, it helps me stay balanced. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm when I'm writing it's sort of like I'm not here in this world I'm in somewhere else and so I have time a little vacation from it to get my blood pressure down and and be in a world where I at least think I can control it or it's mine <laughs> it's that illusion of control that we that we live for yes <laughs> it's like a good day of writing you know okay, when you're yes. oh it's pretty darn good or I got more pages than usual so yeah, we tried. You know, yeah, there's something about just putting your whole effort and your whole being into something mm -hmm. you know, and, and really investing in it that I think is, you know, productive and wholesome and, and you know, good for you. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, when, because, well, one thing I love about teaching writing is you, you know, especially with young people, they do something they didn't think they could do. And wow, yeah. that's really cool. Well, Which is a place think it's, about asking if someone might have a question of us. I think so. <laughs> Hi, thank you guys so much. We've had a few questions come in. So I'll um, pose those to you guys. And then um, I invite anyone who still has questions. Um, some people have been dropping these in the chat. Um, you can also use the Q&A tab to ask questions. 
So we're going to start with a question that's very focused on the book. And then I think we're going to like pull out from there to some other thoughts. So the first question we got was what um, do Tori's pictures in the book symbolize? Or how should we think about Tori's pictures in the book? Well, I think they save her. <laughs> You know, um, that, that they, they get her out of, I mean, poor, poor Tori. You know, when I was originally writing the book, I thought I was going to kill her off. But then I thought, no, let's keep her around and see what comes of her. And she goes on a journey where she has to recover from this terrible accident. And she's someone who uh, certainly wanted to get out of town, at least as much as her brother. Um, but... Uh, uh, you, the pictures are her art. Um, so she's, she's actually the artist in the family. Uh, and by the end, she has found this other soul, uh, Elton, you know, through the unlikely you know, connection with cousin Chip. Uh, and they practice art together. And that allows her a life and a vision and happiness. Uh, so, I mean, they're they're eccentric pictures. I mean, they're, super, they're meant to be eccentric. And when she first starts taking them and her mother is looking at them and saying, these are actually pictures of people looking at my terribly scarred daughter going, huh, you know, or, huh, you know, so there's, uh, there, there's that kind of layer to them. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> no. um, I, that was great, Barb. Anything you wanna add as a reader of that section before we move on? Loved it when Jean said that she thought she was going to kill her off, and then said, "Oh, why? Why not? Why do I want to do that for? I just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm really glad you didn't kill her off, Jean. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. So, great. So my next question, I'm going to um, kind of phrase it a little bit differently than how it came in, and hopefully this still kind of honors the intention of the question asker. But how, for Eugene, um, did the act of writing this book? connect to your own understanding of home or, or how are you thinking about home and what your personal kind of thinking about that with this book? I, I, I honestly wish I could remember, but trying to reconstruct it, uh, you know, I, I guess I was thinking of it through the idea of a young person who has that restlessness, you know, which I, I'm pretty sure I did, <laughs> you know, let's, let's get out of here and start living. You know, let's let's live our own life. You know, I, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. Uh, and home, you know, kind of sneaks around and bites you in the butt. You know, uh, after after a number of years, you know, you you don't leave home. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I guess that's the irony of the title. Uh, so home is the departure point, but it's also the arrival. Yeah, you know, it's also what you circle back around to, or at least that's what happens in the book. And I think that's my feeling too. Thanks. Um, another question came in and the question asker asked, I'm interested in more discussion of what the Midwest has. Um, and so kind of thinking and, um, about maybe not what it lacks, but what right. it has. And I, can I say that when I saw this question came in, and I'm going to drop a link to the chat. Many years ago, Indiana Humanities published an essay by Kurt Vonnegut called To Be a Middle Westerner, which is a lovely short piece of writing. And I'll just read how he ends the book. <laughs> he says, well, he has kind of two points of what he says. Um, first of all, it gives him, um, I'm gonna use his words, cause why would you rewrite anything? He has an aggressively nasal accent. So that's the first thing that is his patrimony <laughs> in the Westerner. Very Vonnegut idiot. Um, and then he says at the end, he talks about what he talks about the geography of the Midwest. And so what geography can give all middle Westerners along with the fresh water and topsoil, if they let it is awe for an Edenic, Edenic continent stretching forever in all directions, makes you religious, takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. But I'll, that's Vonnegut. Now I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. I think I agree. Uh, you know, there, there's something about that, not that there aren't places in the Midwest that have hills, uh, you know, there are, but I mean, where I live, it's like a tabletop. <laughs> you know, the glacier came through and just shoved everything aside and you can be out uh, in the country just looking at that horizon and, and it seems like there ought to be Godzilla or something coming over, you know, the far horizon just to give it some scale. Uh, so there's, there's that vista, you know, that sense that you can see 
so far in so many directions. And if I am in places like cities or places with high hills or mountains, I get a little claustrophobic. Or if if I if I if I have to stay in a hotel on a really top floor, it's like oh, I I need to get down to the lobby. I uh, I don't know. It's something. It's it's spatial almost. You know, uh, it's the way we orient ourselves. You know. I, I don't like the mountains. They make me really anxious because I don't like to see that far. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So there's mm -hmm. something about you you can you can see dead ahead. Now that none of that stops two farmers going, you know, at crossroads from hitting each other at an intersection. You know, I mean they can see each other for miles. You still there's still impacts, but I, I don't know. I, I think it's just kind of a matter of factness, of practicality, uh, you know, and there, hey, there's nowhere to hide, uh, you know, uh, you know or not, not much to distract you. Or as a, a friend of mine once said, we, we spell nature in lowercase letters you know, around here. <laughs> so, so, but I think Midwesterners are nice. I, I remember being a, with a group of people, one was from New York, and we were in Minnesota, and we just kind of walked across the street without, you know, and a car stopped for us, and the person said, my God, if we were in New York, we'd be dead. <laughs> I said, we do that here, you know, yeah. we're nice, and I do, I do think the space, I think Indiana is beautiful. I think, you know, driving through the country, especially in the summer with the corn. And, and I love driving. We used to drive sometimes to Colorado to go skiing and driving through Kansas when in the winter and the, it's like yellow mountains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I jump in here and ask another question? Please. Um, one of my favorite parts of the book was when describing Norm and Martha, Blake says, they didn't think in terms of happy. And I will say, mm -hmm. this is also one of the just perfect little reveals of character, right? So I see, and this is the author question asker, question asker, I see a Midwestern or Protestant work ethic at the center of that statement. So I wanted to ask about the flip side. How does joy work in the lives of these characters? Wow. Huh. Well, once in a while you get to go dancing. Uh, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, once you've done the dishes, you can go dancing. Yeah. Um, well, good question. Uh, I, I have to try and make a little mental migration to get into their heads again. Uh, you know, a job well done. You know, you you uh, you live up to your responsibilities. You take care of your own. Yeah, you stand on your own two feet. Uh, you know, you you help out. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, some some kind of wholesome satisfactions. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm guessing. <laughs> you know. well, I think so when the family comes together, and um, mm. at least until they start fighting, <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, you know, just to see your kids grown up and 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 back in your home. I think there's smaller joys, maybe. But again, that makes me wonder. Are those joys of, of class or place or what, you know? Um, sometimes I, I think the simple joys are maybe more satisfying. Well, you know, I, I don't, per, perhaps they are. Uh, I don't want to diminish these characters and say they don't have a complicated inner life, that they just really live to milk the cows and wash the chickens or something. But, you know, I, I think that work ethic is powerful, you know, in them. And, and there, was, there was a heck of a lot of work to do on the old homestead. No, I mean that's what they're saying at the last in the last chapter is that if you wanted Kentucky Fried Chicken, you had to go out and first catch your chicken, uh, you know, uh, and, and kill it and you know defeather it, and, you know, then then you can chop it up and fry it. Uh, you know, every everything was so labor intensive. Um, you know, I was I was looking back at some of the uh, Abe Lincoln in Indiana, you know, material that I had gathered at one point and. You know, just to get to their uh, homestead, uh, it, there were these, you know, vines growing up from the ground and up into the trees and then down again. So it wasn't just going through a forest, it was hacking your way through 
undergrowth and and twisting you know you know you know things that creeping creeping you know creepers you know but but just the 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 intense labor it took to get even this miserable homestead you know uh you know put together um so i think you can take satisfaction in that and and you know we all maybe have our equivalents and you know we're not homesteaders now but you know uh, by God, we got that kitchen remodeled or, or whatever, uh, you know, whatever our chore is. Uh, okay. Uh, we got that book finished. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ask, we're not going to get to all the questions tonight. So I'm going to ask one more. And this is a question for both Barb and Jean. And I think I'll ask Barb to start and then go to Jean. And then, then I'll, I'll come back on and wrap up real quick. How do you get over the fear of sharing your works with others? I get anxious that it won't be any good. So maybe Barb and then Jean. Ooh, that's such a good question. And it's so hard, really, especially when you're first starting out. But I have to say where I am now is that I regard it as a great gift. I think you have to be careful. I think you have to give it to people who are good readers and will be honest with you without being mean. But, but what you want to know is what is the difference between the thing that's in your head and the words that you have gotten on the page? And you can't know that yourself because you already know what's in your head and what you want it to be. So when you read your words, you just bring all that stuff to the words. Um, and, and what you need is the person who can show you the gap between <clears throat> what's in your head and what's in the world or what's on the page. And so it's incredible when someone can do that for you because it shortcuts stuff so much. You have to have somebody who knows what you're trying to do. Um, otherwise, they'll just confuse you. But I have to say, you know, you, you got to get to the place where you think of it as a gift. And um, I really do at this point in my life. And I'm really lucky to be in two amazing small writing groups um, where I can count on the people. And I never was in a writing group until the last few years, but it's been an amazing thing for me. I've been more prolific in the last five years than I ever was since I started these groups. And it's all about criticism, which maybe really isn't even the right word, but that's me. You know, I, I just want to echo that and say, you know, a writer's group, what, what writers need is an audience. Mm -hmm. And your, your first audience when you first start writing should be, you know, a group of peers as much as possible. I mean, this is why there are writers groups and workshops and why all, why there's this whole industry of, of people getting together and writing. Uh, I mean, I suppose if, if you're, you know, uh, Flaubert, you have your one good friend that sits across from you at the fireplace every evening and listens to you. But, you know, most of us don't have that luxury. So, you know, going into a group where everyone is, is pretty much of a peer Although, you know, we're workshop dynamics, we could spend another hour talking about that, you know, who's, who's, who's the peacock and who's the neurotic and everything. But, but if you go in with goodwill and everyone is learning, everyone is there to learn from each other, that's the, you know, I mean, yes, it could be nervous, you know, but everybody's in it together. It's a shared, you know, experience. So I, I want to second that. So, you know, if, if you're out there writing and you, oh, you don't know what, what, what if it's any good, find a group uh, and you can do it online easily, you know, easily, uh, even before we all had to live our lives online, there were online writers group and, and people sharing their writing. And, and that's, and, and also all, taking it a step further, you know, after a while you shouldn't need, you know, 15 people telling you what you did right or what you did wrong. Uh, after a while, you should outgrow that, you know, need for hand holders, you know, to tell you, yes, this is good and this is bad. After a while, you you get to incorporate some of that, I think. You know. it's, it's a great discipline for me because I we are every other week and I'm going to have something, you know, whereas I might, if I were in a bad way with my writing, I, I would not do it. <clears throat> I know that group's coming. I'm going to be there and I'm going to have something, even if it's just two pages. Yeah, because otherwise it's just too easy to say, oh, who cares? And, yeah. and, and you know what? The answer is nobody cares. <laughs> you know, nobody cares if you don't care. If, you know, the world can go on perfectly well without you writing one more line. You know, yeah. so you better care. You better care about it. There's nothing wrong with what you just wrote. 
because there probably is. And if you just assume that, it's like going to the doctor, you know, you go to the doctor. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Please. <laughs> In a good way, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much for tonight's conversation. Um, we have jumped through a million hurdles and I appreciate coming to the end of this with you. Um, I just wanna wrap up with a couple of quick thank yous. On behalf of all of us at Indiana Humanities, thank you so much to both Jean Thompson and Barb Shoup for being part of tonight's concluding event for One State, One Story and Inseparable. Um, I'd like to take a special moment to thank a few people who made this event possible. First, Megan Taligman on our team, who led the selection process for One State, One Story and has beautifully run this program all year long in spite of many unexpected hurdles. I'd also like to thank Claire Mushbaugh for all of her technical and events wizardry. Believe me, if we had met in person, you would have seen Claire's genius up close and personal. Think like thematic snacks, but <laughs> she has been instrumental behind the scenes to transition this event to online. And finally, a huge shout out to Connie Brom, our incredible events intern. Connie is a graduate student at IU and has been with us since the spring, so a chaotic and unprecedented time in Indiana humanities history. She has taken the reins of this and several other events. I can't imagine having gotten to this point in this truly crazy year without Connie's calm, organization, sense of humor, and professionalism. So thank you, Connie, and to everyone who was here tonight. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Okay, and thank you. you know, I, I, I echo that and everybody who tuned in to, to hear us, I love you. Thank you so much. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Thank you.